This song is from the Electric Castle, which we've heard some songs from. It's about the Indian being drawn towards a breeze and soars away from the Tower of Hope, the previous song. She believes she will melt away into the sun and become one with the universe. The Roman and the future man try to stop her, warning her that she will only die. The breeze reveals himself to be death, and he claims the life of the Indian. On the vocals, we have Simone Simons, wonderful, as the Indian, Edward Reekers as the future man, Edwin Ballow, the Roman, and Mark Janssen and George Ostuk are death. Uh, John Delancey's is the narrator, of course. We love John's voice. Very, very descriptive voice. Ah, thank you, Cosmic. Cosmic is our Arian historian. How about that? Oh, thank you, Lynx. Glad you could be here. All right. They don't like the way Mark growls. Let's see. What's what's there not to like? Oh, well, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> in this maze of emotions, in this tower of dreams, false hopes may lead you astray. Follow me if you dare. I am the breeze, the bringer of rest and ease. I am the wind, the forgiver of those who sin. I am death, the destroyer of worlds. Simone's voice is so crystal clear. But even more than that, the ability to transmit so much textual clarity while maintaining such a smooth vocal line, such a smooth legato, such a smooth flow of air. You can hear and you can feel the flow of air being uninhibited by the text. That's the difference. You know, that's that's pro level singing. Being able to keep that vocal line uninterrupted in any genre, right? Keeping that that line of sound, that stream of sound uninterrupted, which is the stream of sound is the vowels. That's the beauty, right, Scoots? Yeah. Her voice is always so beautiful, but the the stream of sound is the beauty you hear in the voice. And then consonants and the way you form words, that's you know, the text, and the that's, text is very important, too. The goal needs to be to create really clear text without interrupting the beauty, and she is an absolute master class in doing that. Like, you hear, you, you, you never hear the sound stopping 
even though she's making really clear text above it. And she never compromises sound for text. And yet we get so much beauty in the sound and we get so much clarity in the text. I, you never miss a word that she sings. And you always hear the beauty in her sound. Awesome. I'm drawn towards the sun And then we will be one I soar the mountain to the universe It's all a lie just So don't give in Yo, Edwin with that scream, though. Oh, man. I also, I love Edward's kind of like low. Mm, it's that it's like a power tenor voice, but it's he's not singing high. So it's just really nice and warm and a very comforting, friendly sound in this case. Well, you can't forget Marcella and Diane in the background. They're they're such regulars. They're so, their sounds together are so iconic for Arion. <laughs> Okay, uh, Mark has the longer hair, right? And then, um, right, 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 right. And, and George is the bald guy. So, yeah, no, I, another conversation for another time, but I love Diana, uh, Diane in, in Ex Libris. I don't know, I don't, I've never heard her in another context, though, except for Ariane. Um, I want to go back and listen to this real quick because I was I was really thinking about what someone said earlier. People don't like Mark's screaming in this, and I'm trying to find a problem with it. Uh, he he, there's not a lot as much depth in his sound as with George. Uh, in George, we get a lot more kind of color in the back. But what Mark does really well in his screaming, and we've heard him do this with Epica as well, is that his higher screams have a lot more bite to them. You know, a lot more forward resonance in the sound. And that that comes from the way that it's the same concept of like if you sing in head voice in your whole range, it'll be strong in the top and it'll be weaker in the bottom. It's the same. It's the same idea of phonation. I don't know exactly how technically that would work using the false folds as a scream mechanic, but it's the same kind of uh, lighter occlusion that creates faster frequencies more intensely and slower frequencies a little weaker, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, Elrond, come on, man. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think those two those two growls, you know, Mark has more of like a screamy screechy quality. Uh and 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 um 
George has more of that depth and sound. Regardless, when Simone comes back in with that lovely, you know, soprano texture, you close your eyes and it's just like it's just like an ear massage. You get so much. It's, it's almost overwhelming. Oh, Capriani, thank you for that gifted sub. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I... Welcome, Marie. <laughs> hey, Reverb, good to see you. So I want to go back and now, now that I'm not trying to like pick out flaws, it's so irresponsible, pick out flaws in anyone, let's listen to that overall texture. And that moment is where you hear kind of Mark and his before up to this you were hearing George in his sweet spot, but now we're hearing Mark kind of flip up into that sweet spot of his of his voice. Beautiful screen. See you guys. Cosmic, I love that. In in classical music, and especially in opera, well actually opera is probably one of the only uh times this this is a really pure example. In opera, the orchestra usually represents, at least towards the end of the 19th century and throughout the 20th century, the orchestra represents the inner psyche of the character, right? You can hear their singing and you can you can you know you can hear the melody of what they're singing, but it's the orchestra that's telling you what these singers actually thinking, what the character is actually thinking. And Arian uses that that type of musical uh, musicality exactly well when it comes to Yost's playing uh on the on the keyboard um on the synth right and and we hear that contrast and texture right up until Simone's character the Indian dies and how she's trusting this this wind or death character right uh we hear that psychology in the synth <laughs> Now it's hopeful. Now it's ominous.
I love how Aryan gives us all of these like maximalist huge textures at the end. It's very prog, right? It's very prog rock. But but these da 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 these repeated huge ideas uh really reminds me of Reticle Circus in a way. But um it it just piles home the idea of like yeah, death is final. You know, this is finalized for this character. This character is canceled. This character is dead. Over. Um on the one hand, she thought it was going to be beautiful and and it's not, you know, it's death. She thought she was going to be immortalized forever. But then there's this really big gray area made through just that maximalist texture. Now, going back, uh, yeah, also, I think Yost has nine keyboards. I, I think that I, oh, two, keyboard, two keyboards are Hammond, so eight. So maybe eight, nine. I, I, th I thought I counted nine. Um, but if you're, if you are representing... You know, Aryan is clearly someone who has very specific ideas when it comes to what certain musical textures mean, musical sounds mean in a dramatic performance. So you need a lot of different sets. You need a lot more sounds than you can just get with a band. And that's where the keyboardist comes in, obviously, in a lot of these prog and symphonic metal groups. Um, so that's why all of those keyboards would be necessary to have different sounds on all of them set up at all times, ready to transfer whatever he needs to play whenever he needs to play it. Uh, because there's so much dynamic shift, more than you know. Someone mentioned Tuomas, more keyboards in Tuomas. Well, I think there's more uh, sonic shifts in Arian music and in, in a lot of Arian's compositions than there is in Tuomas's compositions. It's because in, in within the songs, between songs, you can switch presets and make things work. But um, you know, when you're playing, it's a little you know you want to have those things at your disposal when you just want to you know play. You want them to be set up, all that stuff. Oh, Airy. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being here. Uh, let's talk about real quick, Mini Lou, that sh that cry, that shriek. This is uh, something I can actually talk about well because it's a, there's a lot of crossover here in technique wise. So let's let's hear Simone die. <laughs> So the way that she does that is not through tightening here to go ah that's that's not gonna work. It's it needs to be prepared with the breath and needs to be it maximizing the head resonance in a way that it's just taking that smallest crystal clear sound at a really high pitch and then using enough air to let it drop. Now you do that with a lot more air, a little less tension here, more relaxation here, and standing up and, and being really warmed up with your voice, and having a voice like Simone's, uh, you know, a high soprano, then that turns into, you know, that whistle tone. And it doesn't it doesn't end up here. It has to end up, it has to feel, when you sing, when you do that right, because she's singing it, she's not actually sh shrieking. She's just singing in a context that makes it sound like she's shrieking. It feels like that sound is, far out of your head it feels like that sound is like coming out not inside not inside here none of that um if that helps maybe but it's again it's a it's a practice thing <laughs> let's watch simone die i'm sorry janelle it's her character right it's simone's character cool guys very cool well it's it's not like throwing it out it it just it you need to have the you know the breath prepared almost like a sigh right that pitch she has is like billion times out of my range but for a soprano voice it's not inaccessible uh it just needs to feel like <sighs> in a way that you know is comfortable that's when you can get to that crystal clear clarity <laughs> 